In this video, we've combined some of the most disturbing cave diving tragedies that happened in Florida that we've covered on this channel so far. From divers who got lost in the silt to divers who made a wrong turn and struggled to find their way out. If you enjoy watching these videos, make sure to subscribe to our channel for more exciting cave diving stories like these. Picture it, the sun beating down on white sandy beaches, palm trees swaying in the warm breeze, and tourists flocking to Florida for some fun in the sun. But beneath the surface of the crystal clear water lies a whole other world, one of mysterious and breathtaking underwater caverns. It's no wonder that cave diving is a popular pastime in the state, with divers from all over the globe coming to explore the depths. But this treacherous activity is not without its dangers, as two college students from Florida would soon discover in July of 1992. This is the story of their terrifying descent into the unknown. Get ready to hold your breath and dive into the unknown as you discover the rich history, the advancements, and the tragedies that lie beneath the Florida surface. Alachua Sink located in Alachua, Florida, may have been renamed to Mill Creek Sink in 2003, but many divers and locals still refer to it by its original name. This sinkhole holds a rich history for cave divers, as it's the only known access point to the underground Mill Creek stream. The sink is located at the bottom of a 50-foot, nearly vertical cliff edge, and the debris of fallen trees and bushes make the water at the surface a constant murky green color. It may not seem appealing or inviting at first glance, but appearances can be deceiving. Once a diver enters the Alachua sink and makes their way through the sinkhole, the water begins to clear out, revealing a beautiful cave system. Alachua sink was first explored by none other than the famous cave divers Sheck Exley and Court Smith, who mapped and published the sinkhole for others to follow. Accessing the sinkhole is no easy feat, in the 1980s, divers had to tie a rope around a nearby tree and repel in with over a hundred pounds of gear on their backs. And that's just the beginning. Once in the water, divers must descend to a depth of 130 feet before reaching the bottom, where the main cave system splits into two tunnels, one leading upstream against the flow and the other downstream with the flow. Visibility can be extremely poor depending on the weather and the amount of debris that has fallen into the sink. Divers may have to wait a few days for visibility to improve, and even on good days, it typically doesn't get better until a diver enters one of the tunnels. Each pathway is filled with caverns that can reach as deep as 227 feet. Diving below 20 to 30 feet increases the risk of exploration for inexperienced divers as decompression stops are needed to expel dissolved nitrogen in the diver's bloodstream as they surface. Failing to do so can bring on the bends, which can be painful and in extreme cases, lead to death. Brace yourself for a dive into the unknown, where danger lurks around every corner and visibility is next to none. The Alachua sink is not for the faint of heart, as simply losing the line can lead to a catastrophic situation. This is a cave that's reserved for the most experienced divers, those with over 100 cave dives post-certification and a guide by their side. These strict rules were established after a tragic event that took place in July 1992. It's a story that will make your heart race and test your courage. Meet Lance Crawford, a 23-year-old thrill seeker and University of Florida agriculture student. He was always drawn to exploring the great outdoors and had recently obtained his cave diving certification. Eager to test his limits, Lance had heard of the challenges and dangers of the Alachua sinkhole and knew it was the ultimate test for him. He loved activities like skydiving and shark hunting and was always looking for new and exciting challenges. So it's no surprise that he would develop an interest in cave diving and the Alachua sinkhole was calling his name. It was a sinister and starry night on July 24th when Lance and his diving partner set out to conquer the treacherous Alachua sinkhole. His friend, like Lance, was also a newly certified cave diver, and the two were determined to reach the depths of the Mill Creek stream. While Lance's partner's identity remains unknown, for the sake of this story, we're going to call him John. 
The duo found the sinkhole and lugged their gear 50 feet down a steep incline, using a rope tied to a tree to slowly lower themselves. The clock was ticking as they entered the water, with the stars shining brightly above. But as they dove in, they were met with poor visibility due to recent rains and could only see about six inches in front of them. It was going to be a challenging dive, but the thrill of the unknown was calling them. As the two divers prepared to plunge into the depths of the Alachua sinkhole, an eerie feeling of unease washed over John. The conditions were poor, and he couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. He was not as excited as Lance, and deep down, he didn't feel safe. They both knew they were under-experienced for this cave, and the warning signs were there. But Lance was filled with excitement at the thought of what lay beneath. He loved diving and was eager to take on the challenge, regardless of the conditions. He had a carefree attitude, almost as if he didn't believe the dive could be dangerous. Despite John's reluctance, they both slid on their masks and submerged themselves into the unknown. It's important to note that a dive line is not normally set up at the entrance of a cave. This is to make sure that recreational divers don't enter a cave by accident. But for Lance, this dive was far from an accident. It was a calculated risk and an exhilarating adventure. As Lance and John dove deeper into the Alachua sinkhole, the visibility only got worse. A dive line was almost mandatory to even begin the dive due to the poor visibility. Once they identified the dive line, they followed it deeper into the depths. After moving down the first room, they entered a three to four hundred foot wide open room called Crawfish Heaven. But as they continued, the visibility only got worse, making it difficult to even see the walls that surrounded them. With only a few minutes into the dive, John's doubts began to grow. The risks were extremely high, with no sign of reprieve. He honestly had no desire to continue and didn't see the point in pushing himself further. The exact position of Lance and John at this moment is unclear. It's not even clear if they were on the same guideline, but what is clear is that both divers were near each other, with John either ahead of Lance or on a separate line. John, feeling uneasy about the dive and continuing, would try to locate Lance, but again the visibility was so poor it was challenging to keep sight of each other. As John turned to search for Lance, he couldn't spot him. With the already high level of nerves, John knew he had to keep calm, which was easier said than done. He was panicking deep down. Nevertheless, he quit moving deeper into the cave. He searched the water all around him for a sign from Lance. Over and over his hands reached out, but every time they returned empty. John was careful and meticulous in order not to silt out the water even further, but with the current visibility it was almost impossible not to make a mistake. He didn't know at the time how long he had been searching for Lance, but would later find out he had spent over an hour searching through the silt, barely able to see his hands reaching out in front of him. It was a desperate search, one that would push him to the brink of his limits, but he was determined to find his diving partner and bring him back to safety. As the minutes ticked by, John's frustration and fear grew. He knew he had to turn back and make his way to the surface. He turned himself around with the help of the guideline and began to slowly swim back, all the while keeping a vigilant eye out for Lance, feeling in all directions as far as his arms would extend. It didn't take long for him to resurface, as they had not ventured too far into the cave. Once he was above water, John quickly got out of the sink and took a moment to examine the water. He searched for bubbles, any sign of air escaping that could have been coming from Lance's oxygen tanks. But just like under the surface, he saw nothing. The realization of the situation began to hit him, as his stomach turned over with dread. He was beginning to lose hope. This was a race against time, a desperate search for his diving partner in the face of impossible odds. As the night wore on, the situation grew increasingly dire. The Alachua police were contacted and informed of the situation, and they immediately called on the cave diver recovery team at Jenny Springs to assist. A team of 10 highly experienced cave divers responded to the call and quickly gathered their equipment. The sink was constantly monitored in case Lance resurfaced, but as the night continued, the mood became more grim. If Lance had somehow survived, he should have resurfaced by now, and along with the fact that no air bubbles had been spotted, their chances were dwindling. 
Led by Jared Jablonski, all 10 divers entered the water at 8 a.m. Saturday morning, almost 11 hours after Lance and John had originally entered the sink. The entire day was spent looking for any sign of Lance, but there was none. Progress was gruelingly slow for everyone, as divers struggled to venture far due to the poor visibility. Rainfall only added more debris to the sink, making the rescue more dangerous than it already was. Divers could only see about a foot in front of themselves in the murky water. The search continued over the next few days in a painfully slow manner for all those who anxiously waited for news of Lance. The Alachua sink's conditions did not improve through the search, almost as if the sink was deliberately disturbing those searching for answers. As the days passed, the expectation of a body recovery became the primary concern. In total, 50 divers helped with the search, which continued to span over the weekend and into the following week. When Monday came around, morale was at an all-time low, and the team had been searching for two and a half days now, with no sign of Lance. All news outlets at this point were reporting that Lance was most likely dead inside the cave. But then, in the late afternoon, a glimmer of hope emerged. A diver was searching along the wall in the crawfish heaven room when he noticed an indentation in the wall forming a lip formation. It was there that Lance Crawford was found. The scene was painful to find and diagnose as it was clear Lance had struggled until his last breath. All of his gear was still attached, although his mouthpiece was not in his mouth. From where his body was positioned, it was apparent that Lance was looking for the exit but had no visibility in the cave. He must have fought with all his might, adrenaline pumping through his veins as he frantically searched for a way out, crawling along the wall with no guideline. The small indentations along the walls can easily deceive the mind, leading one to mistake the lip formation as an opening just like Lance did. In his panic state, with no visibility, he wedged himself deeper and deeper into the formation, believing it would lead to freedom. But the restriction only grew tighter and tighter, with no escape. His body was stuck deep within the wedge, making it impossible for easy removal, and his death would ultimately be ruled as a drowning. Divers worked tirelessly through the night to finally retrieve his body, their efforts hindered by the limited space and poor visibility. He was lost to the depths until midday on Tuesday, when his body was finally recovered. That's a haunting reminder of the challenges faced by the rescue team and a tragic end to a daring and adventurous journey. But this story is not just about loss. It's a heart-wrenching tribute to Lance Crawford's memory and the valuable lessons that can be learned from his experience. It serves as a reminder to take every dive seriously, to never push ourselves past high-risk conditions, and to always trust our gut instincts. It's impossible to say if Lance could have done something differently to save himself, but it's clear that if he and his diving partner had more experience, they would not have attempted to dive in the treacherous conditions of Alachua Sink. And perhaps they both would have made it out alive that dreadful night. Let Lance's story be a cautionary tale and a reminder to always dive safely. A family consisting of a father, son, and daughter went on a dive adventure into the Twin Caves. Things took a drastic turn when they dived deeper into the cave and they started to kick up silt. Stay tuned to the end of this video as we reveal more about the incidents of this family diving tragedy. Merritt's Mill Pond is located in Jackson County, some distance away from Mariana, Florida. It has seven springs spread over a four-mile-long pond, including the Twin Caves. Two connected but distinct caverns make up this spectacular diving spot. The northern opening is about 18 and a half feet, and the southern opening is shallower. Both openings are in a calm depression at the bottom of the mill pond, which is about 50 feet north to south and 25 feet east to west. Freshwater springs may be found in both caves, and they both have air spaces at the ends. The water in Merritt's mill pond is generally turquoise blue and very clear. The two openings are covered by this water, and there are some plants around them. The bottom of the cave is filled with sand and limestone which can cause a silted cave when it's kicked up, as we will see in this video. In August 2012, a diver named Raymond went for a diving adventure into the Twin Caves together with his daughter Alexandra and his son. 
The father was an open water diving instructor. His son and daughter were just in the college age range. They hired a pontoon boat from Cave Adventures. The dive shop owner, Ed Sorensen, advised them not to enter the Twin Caves as open water divers, since it's only appropriate for certified cave divers. Twin Caves are prone to silting, and it is very dangerous for inexperienced divers to dive into the cave system. The three family divers weren't the only ones who made their way to the cave. Some other divers had been into the cave and were just coming out when they were about to enter it. They entered the water gracefully with not much difficulty as they were doing open water diving. But at some point, they decided to go further into the cave, neglecting the advice from the dive shop owner. As they were entering the cave, Andrea, a cave diver, her husband, and a diving buddy were exiting the cave. They were diving high up in the cave to reduce the chance to kick up silt, which is common at the bottom of the cave. Andrea saw the three family divers entering the cave, but assumed they didn't see her and her fellow divers. One of the things that can affect divers in this type of cave is entering the cave when others are leaving. Their activities would have caused a certain amount of silt within the cave, and this will definitely affect visibility. Alexandra was about 20 feet into the cave with her father and brother following closely behind when they passed Andrea and her diving group. Alexandra was carrying a single cylinder and a flashlight, which she used to light up the water and was amazed by the stunning view of the cave. As they were open water divers, they used the up and down flutter style kicks, which started to stir up the silt and within a short time, the visibility dropped to zero. She thought if she kept swimming, the silt would clear out. Unfortunately, it was getting worse, and suddenly the lovely family diving adventure soon turned into the worst-case scenario when they found themselves in a life-threatening situation. Alexandra could not see anything, and she started to breathe heavily. She turned around to look for her father and brother, but she couldn't find them. She panicked and started to kick even harder, causing more silt into the cave. At this point, she couldn't even see her own hand anymore and got herself into a nightmare situation. When the silt filled up the cave, resulting in very poor visibility, Raymond lost his daughter Alexandra. He dove further into the cave, looking for her. Fortunately, he was able to find her and signaled her that they needed to get out of the cave immediately. However, due to the silt, they couldn't even see each other's faces. Therefore, Raymond grabbed his daughter tight and started swimming in one direction. No idea if this direction was the correct way out. Suddenly, Raymond felt a wall and started to move along this wall. While doing this, he realized that they could hit something sharp which could damage their diving equipment. This could cause an even more dangerous situation, so he adjusted his air tank and line to protect his gear. While doing this, he briefly let go of his daughter, Alexandra. When he finished, he reached out for her, but she was gone. He panicked, but thought she might have swum further in the direction they were going. So he also continued. Eventually, he was able to reach the entrance of the cave and surface safely. Unfortunately, when he surfaced, Alexandra wasn't there. Before Raymond left the cave, Andrea and her group were exiting the cave. They were swimming high up in the cave because of the heavy silt on the bottom of the cave. Only a few feet from the exit, something suddenly touched her arms and she saw a light beam in her face. It was the fins of Raymond's son. Andrea signaled to him to leave the cave and within a few minutes he was able to get to the surface. Andrea and her husband too exited the cave using touch contact since they could no longer see themselves. Their other partner exited the cave through another opening and the three met on the surface. The three dive buddies could only see the sun at the surface and asked what they were doing. The sun was in shock because he lost his father and sister in the cave. He told them their father knew what they were doing and they should call emergency services because his father and sister needed help in the silted cave. A few moments later, Raymond also surfaced and he swam over to them. He asked them if they had seen Alexandra, but they all didn't know where Alexandra was. Raymond was in shock when he realized his daughter must have gotten lost in the silted cave. They returned to the entrance of the cave in search of the young girl, but they were only making matters worse by causing more silt to accumulate. When they realized that their own lives were already in danger, they returned to the surface to call out for help to the cave adventures dive shop nearby. 
Luck shone on them because Ed Sorensen, an experienced cave diver and a great cave rescuer, was on Merrittsville Pond preparing for a cave diving class with his students at Jackson Blue Spring, which is on the same pond. Ed left Jackson Blue Spring, which was just a mile's journey to the Twin Caves. He arrived at the incident site in less than 20 minutes after they called him for help. He was quickly briefed about the location of the girl by her father before entering the cave. When he entered, he discovered that the Twin Caves had been covered with about a 60-foot circle of mud. But because he had several experiences in this kind of situation and has been diving in this cave for a long time, he deployed his reel and made his way to the gold line that's inside the cave, even in conditions with close to zero visibility. He began to search for the lost girl from this gold line, and a lot of thoughts ran through his mind. Of course, who wouldn't think wild in such a situation, where you know you are jeopardizing your very life for the sake of others? But Ed had been known for diving in places where other divers wouldn't go, and he has always been successful in every one of his rescue operations. He promptly dove into the silt-filled cave, which was almost completely dark and everywhere filled with mud. Although he hardly saw anything before him, he continued to search for Alexandra, who must have been in a great panic. When a victim is in a panic state, it becomes more risky for you to rescue him. He tied off his primary spool and deployed a safety spool to start a zigzag search. He continued to dive down slowly, Having the safety of the girl in mind, just a few minutes into the search, he stumbled upon the girl who was standing in the silt. She put her head in a pocket of air at the top of the cave. The water in the cave was almost reaching her chin, and she no longer had a regulator in her mouth. Though breathing in air from this kind of pocket was dangerous, she possibly did not have other alternatives than to breathe from the air pocket she had found. Upon finding her, Ed told the girl to stay calm and hold on to his arms so that he could bring her out safely. She did just as she was instructed, and both of them made their way to the entrance of the cave. Upon reaching the entrance, they dove upstream to the surface. All that were waiting for them on the surface were greatly surprised at the speed of the rescue, which was just within 10 minutes. But at the same time, they were all filled with great joy that Alexandra was rescued safely. She was very cold and shivering, but she had no further complications. While alone in the dark, cold cave, the girl became very confused and almost gave up on her survival. She had no thermal protection, which could have kept her warm in that cold water. She had to devise means to keep herself warm by kicking and moving around. She was left with less than one-third of air in her cylinder. She thought she would drown as soon as she ran out of air, but help came for her and she was rescued alive. Raymond was sincerely grateful to Ed Sorensen, who had just saved his daughter from dying in cold, dark water. Alexandra, who was just a few minutes away from drowning and knew the agony she just passed through before Ed found her, also showed her sincere gratitude to her rescuer. She continued to send him letters of gratitude for several months, and her father offered Ed some money, but he refused it. Raymond later donated a huge amount of money to the Divers Alert Network, for the sake of safety, divers are advised to stay within their levels of training and to follow guidelines to avoid stories that touch the heart. Eagle's Nest Sinkhole, widely regarded as the Mount Everest of cave diving, is one of the most impressive cave dive sites in the world. The cave is known due to its stunning views, extreme depth, and remote location. The views may be breathtaking, but precaution is required because numerous divers haven't seen daylight again after entering the Eagle's Nest. Eagle's Nest Sinkhole is located within the Chazahowitzka Wildlife Management Area in West Central Florida, and it has an amazing underwater cave system. From the surface, it doesn't look very fascinating. It looks like it's filled with alligators, and the swarms of mosquitoes and ticks above the surface can be annoying. You can barely find any sign that a beautiful world exists within this irritating pond. You can't judge a book by its cover, and this is indeed true of Eagle's Nest. If you are to look at the conditions surrounding the surface, you'll never behold the elegance of nature below it. You can call it a dangerous beauty. Of course, it is beautiful within, yet it can be dangerous right inside the cave too. What are those discouraging things at the surface of this sinkhole? 
At the surface, the water has a greenish color. It is dark and difficult to see through. Unlike the nearby Buford Springs and Wiki Wachi, which have crystal clear waters, it's just as though it is the home for alligators, mosquitoes, and ticks. Even with all these discouraging sights on the surface, there are a handful of professional divers who have made their way into the underwater cave systems. To them, the eagle's nest is indeed a paradise. It's an admirable top-notch underwater cave system. The visibility in this sinkhole depends greatly on the present situation, that is, the condition of the Florida aquifer and the prevailing amount of rainfall. At the Eagle's Nest sinkhole is a message board that shows different diving conditions encountered by divers who have previously dived there. Unlimited visibility and diving by braille, with zero visibility, are the major conditions stated on the message board. Many times when you get to this sinkhole, you'll discover that it's been covered with tannin. Tannin is a natural organic coloring dye. It makes the water turn darker than usual. In some favorable conditions, the water can sometimes be gin clear. When you dare to enter it, it's like you're in a different world entirely. It is fascinating, magnificent, and risky all at the same time. Eagle's Nest Sinkle is only advisable for those who are qualified and experienced because it's a dreadful cave diving site. Another caution you need to take is finding your way within the cave system. You can easily miss your way. It is a vicious and unappeasable sinkhole. Though it is recommended for professional divers alone, such divers must still receive information from people who have dived there before or even have them as guides so that they can be aware of the likely situation of things to face within the cave. When entering the Eagle's Nest cave systems, you have to squeeze yourself into the tight, narrow, 70-foot-long passages. Oftentimes, there are many challenges to entering with your diving gear. There are large caverns that are described with magnificent names such as Ballroom, Super Room, and The Pit. The Ballroom is a vast chamber that leads to small dark passages that can reach 300 feet deep in some places. The combination of total darkness and extreme depths, combined with the complicated cave network, makes it an extremely advanced dive. At least 13 divers have died there since 1981. From 1999 to 2003, the site was closed to divers. A large green sign posted near the sink alerts divers to the danger. On September 11, 2005, Judy Bedard and her longtime boyfriend Rudy Banks were set for the dive adventure to the fascinating cave systems of Eagle's Nest Sinkhole. Judy Bedard was a 48-year-old cave diver. She was a diver with a difference and had several diving adventures with her friends in the past. Judy was a certified diver. She was also a registered nurse who worked at Tampa General Hospital and lived in Tampa, Florida. Judy and Rudy entered the water at 4.30 p.m. After a few minutes, they began the dive. When entering Eagle's Nest, what awaits below the surface of the Eagle's Nest is a stunning world-class underwater cave system. It consists of a labyrinth descending 300 feet below the Earth's surface. The intricate network of pathways extends for over a mile and is so amazing that it can be unsafe. The cave system has a downstream tunnel with plenty of rooms that are at least 300 feet deep, and there is also a stretch of the cavern between two of the rooms in this tunnel called the Pit. It's called the pit because the tunnel dips to 300 feet. Judy and Rudy had just begun their dive, taking a slightly slow descent into the cave. Judy was using an oxygen-only tank until she reached 30 feet. She switched to her nitrox tank at this depth. That's a mixture of oxygen and nitrogen. She needed to switch because diving requires different mixes of gas at different depths. The dive was going smoothly until they got to a depth of 130 feet. She began to have some difficulties. Her equipment began to develop some technical problems. At this depth, she switched to her trimix tank, a primary tank, which contained a mixture of oxygen, nitrogen, and helium. This primary tank is the one needed for the depth she had just reached. But unfortunately, the primary tank didn't contain the right proportion of these three gases. Seeing the situation, Banks said Judy switched back to her nitrox tank. 
Because of this, both divers began to ascend back to the surface. Ascending in cave diving is supposed to be a progressive process and not a quick process in order to avoid decompression sickness, which is also called bends. Fast decompression can also cause gas embolism. Embolism is when blood circulation is obstructed due to the presence of bubbles or a blood clot in the bloodstream. At this point, time is not on their side to embark on a slow decompression. Because of the mistake in her primary tank mixes, Judy had been breathing more helium than necessary and almost zero oxygen. By the time they reached 100 feet, Judy had become unconscious. However, her breath seized when they got to 60 feet away from the surface. At this point, Rudy wasn't sure of what option to choose. Judy is dying, and they're still 60 feet away from the surface. If he takes a fast ascent, it'll aggravate Judy's traumatic condition because her body was already deficient in oxygen. If he takes a slow ascent, Judy will eventually die due to lack of oxygen. The former is preferable. She has hope of getting over the decompression sickness rather than dying right within the cave. So Rudy took a very fast ascent and up at the surface, he brought her out. Now he needed help resuscitating Judy. Who would be of help? Greg Stanton, a former diving safety officer at Florida State University, and his friend James Gary, a member of the University of South Florida's Diving Control Board, came to help Rudy after returning from their dives. Greg reported that it is quite unfortunate that it was the ascent that began a kaleidoscope of challenges and the injuries under which she now struggles. She also had arterial gas embolisms. When she reached the surface, Judy did not have any pulse. Her eyes were open and blood and foam were coming out of her mouth. James stopped Dan Pelland, a Spring Hill resident who was coming to Eagle's Nest for some photographs. Using Pelland's phone, James called 911. Pellin helped Rudy carry out CPR on Judy. Because of the state Judy was in, CPR, or cardiopulmonary resuscitation, was needed at this point. It's a medical technique used to revive someone whose heart has stopped beating, a life-saving emergency technique. Judy's heart came back to life 15 to 20 minutes after they began CPR. Her breathing was restored with CPR, but she was yet to regain consciousness. She needed urgent medical attention, but help was not readily available at the moment. The major limitations to getting recovery help at the Eagle's Nest sinkhole are the fact that it's located in a remote area and that it has an unpaved entrance. Though the roads are improved, they are still somewhat rough. They are still left with large potholes, and it's very difficult to get help at this site in case of an accident. As regards the case of Judy, inadequacy in supplies and transportation challenges greatly affected the response from the medical team. They had to rush the victim with a sport utility vehicle on a backboard without an IV drip. The ambulance and helicopter were waiting at the edge of the forest to take Judy to the hospital. Stephen Farmer, a fish and wildlife investigator, made three statements regarding the reasons Judy became badly injured at the cave site agreeing with the words of Greg and James, saying, her trimix tanks had poorly mixed gases. There was a poor analysis of the proportion of gases in her tanks. The isolation valve, which is attached to the manifold that connects the two tanks, was left closed, and she didn't check it to ensure it was open. Some professionals said that Judy was responsible for her equipment. All divers must check their breathing gases before starting their dive. Had she tested the isolation valve, she would have noticed that the tanks were not evenly pressured and probably wouldn't have led to further problems, leading to her canceling the dive. Rudy was unhappy all through that period and was unable to get comfortable because of Judy's health. Judy was flown to Shans and her status was classified as serious. In the first few weeks, expectations for recovery were very low. The doctors were amazed at Judy's survival for the first 24 hours after the dive. Her kidneys failed, and she experienced multiple heart attacks after being taken out of a hyperbaric chamber to treat the air embolisms. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy is an effective method carried out to increase the rate at which gas bubbles are removed by the lungs. Friends and other divers who know Judy as vibrant find it to be a difficult reality. She was a cheerful person who was fun to be around. It was unfortunate that such a fate befell her.
Judy was transported to Tampa General Hospital where she began to rehab. Her full consciousness didn't return until November, two months after the incident. Judy said, I remember waking up. I couldn't move. My legs had atrophied. I had on a tracheostomy tube. I thought, oh my God. During her time in the hospital, Judy had suffered from cardiac arrest, respiratory failure, multiple organ complications, cognitive erosion, and post-traumatic amnesia. Usually, a patient who suffered so much trauma would most likely survive with neurological damage, physical limitations in the arms and legs, and potentially paralysis. When she started, Judy required assistance getting into and out of bed. She struggled to maintain her equilibrium. She was out of breath after approximately 10 steps, even with the aid of a walker with wheels. She underwent months of intense therapy. After around five weeks, she was able to walk more than 300 feet. She had a fortunate life story, and one of her doctors described her recovery as miraculous. Also, her former physical therapist on the brain injury team at the rehabilitation center said, for what she had, it was one of the best outcomes I've ever seen. Judy had outpatient therapy for an additional six months after being discharged from the hospital in January 2006. She spent that time regaining her strength, flexibility, and coordination. The next summer, Judy accomplished something that had previously seemed unimaginable. She went with Rudy, now her husband, on an open water dive in the Gulf of Mexico, right off the coast of Newport Ritchie. As she laid in bed during the months of her rehabilitation, she had been dreaming of it. In June 2007, she went back to work at Tampa General as an operating room nurse, but she eventually made the decision to go to the medical records division. Judy wanted to spend more time diving and didn't want to put in a lot of overtime. Judy resumed her exploration of underwater caverns after shaking off some rust and a load of anxieties. Several places, including Peacock Springs in North Florida, have been attempted by her. On Christmas morning in 2014, Darren Spivey, a 35-year-old Brooksville resident and a roofer by profession, went for a dive at Eagle's Nest together with his son Dylan Sanchez, 15 years old. They received new dive equipment as presents and could not wait to try it out. Darren has had a knack for diving since childhood. He'd always grab a couple of his friends whenever he was free for the weekend and go for a swim. Although he was a certified diver, he didn't have any special cave diving certifications. With his certification, he can dive anything from 0 to 130 feet. Besides, you only need regular air in your tanks and no special equipment for that depth. Divers who dive deeper than 130 feet will almost certainly require special air in their tanks, specialized equipment, and additional training. Six months before the Christmas morning dive, Darren was introduced to Robert Brooks, an experienced cave diver. Robert stated, When he approached me to be his mentor, I told him I couldn't take him caving until he got his cave cart. Robert also stated that he loaned Darren some equipment and encouraged him to take a course to become certified but he continued to put it off. Seeing his dad diving for almost nine years, Dylan also liked to go for a dive with his father. Darren's mother, Sylvia Spivey, said that Dylan, a freshman at Hernando High School, who was enrolled in the junior ROTC program, developed the same passion. He spent hours poring over dive manuals in preparation for his certification. He'd found his niche, Sylvia Spivey said. His father would put him through drills to ensure he knew everything like the back of his hand. It was not the first time they were about to dive into Eagle's Nest. According to family members, Darren and his son had dived at Eagle's Nest several times and were aware of the dangers. The main thing on their minds was safety, said Darren's fiance, Holly King. They never tried to force it. Darren adored his family and his children and would risk everything for them. It all started normally. Darren and Dylan left home at 7 a.m. to test out new diving equipment at Buford Springs, but found out it was flooded, so they decided to drive down to Eagle's Nest Sink. They arrived at around 11 a.m. at a parking lot in front of a wooden dock. This wooden dock had several signs warning visitors of the impending dive. Despite the warnings, Darren and his son donned their scuba gear and waddled across the dock to the water. They jumped in the water, swam for a while, 
and dove further until they reached the Eagle's Nest entrance room. Darren attempted to reassure Robert Brooks, his mentor, that he would remain in Eagle's Nest entrance room, a large cavern known as the ballroom that reaches depths of about 200 feet, rather than entering the narrower tunnels. According to Robert, the ballroom is still a dangerous place for a diver who hasn't had professional cave training, because the ballroom is a dark room that has a set of caves down below. It is quite easy to get lost there. In fact, there is a large sign, Stop, Prevent Your Death, which warns the divers. The ballroom divides into two small caves from the sign. These caves can reach a depth of 300 feet at some points. Darren and his son passed the Eagle's Nest entrance and followed a narrow and long tunnel in the middle of the pond, descending deep into the earth. Usually, divers would grab a guideline to help them navigate the cave system's narrow entry point, which served as the only entrance and exit. Because the water inside was frequently murky, the guideline was required. Once inside this narrow passageway, divers would swim until they couldn't see any sunlight anymore. After diving into the tube, they entered the main ballroom, and Darren kept diving in the ballroom with his son and did not have any problem. But things were about to change for the worse. They kept diving deeper within the cavern, knowing that their oxygen won't last that long. The pair would have needed about an hour to decompress due to their reach depth, rising slowly enough that the air didn't form bubbles in their blood, causing decompression sickness. According to Robert Brooks, they didn't appear to have enough air in their tanks for that process. Dives to that depth also necessitate a mixture in which helium replaces some of the nitrogen in the air. This helps reduce the narcotic effect of nitrogen which becomes stronger at depths greater than 100 feet. Darren and his son, according to Robert, were using simple compressed air. Darren's fiancée, Holly, hadn't heard from him or his son in several hours, so as the sun set, she decided to drive there herself to look for them. Darren texted her just before the boys got in the water to tell her where they were diving. Holly discovered his car near the dock. She decided to call the cops, fearing the worst. Around 7.30 p.m., Holly called the sheriff's office. When Brooks learned of the missing divers, he contacted two other certified cave divers to assist in the search. The police responded quickly and brought recovery divers with them, who were trained to look for missing divers. They decided to go into the eagle's nest, just in case Darren and Dylan got stuck. They followed the guideline into the ballroom through the narrow passage. The divers came to a halt just outside the passage and shined their flashlights up at the ceiling. Divers were frequently trapped near the entrance of underwater caves. Between 9 p.m. and 10 p.m., at a depth of 67 feet, one of the divers discovered Dylan's body floating against the ballroom ceiling. Father Darren's body was discovered at a depth of 127 feet on a large mound on the ballroom floor. According to Brooks, their dive computers and air gauges showed that they had both descended to 233 feet and had run out of air. Dylan first, apparently, because his father had deployed a long breathing hose that allowed his son to breathe from his tank. Father and son died there on Christmas Day. According to authorities, they drowned by accident. An investigation into what went wrong was underway the next day. According to Robert Brooks, who assisted in his recovery, the drownings appear to result from a diver who attempted to go beyond his training and experience. The sad thing is, I told him, one night they'll call me to come get you, Brooks explained. According to Brooks, Darren had taken great care in setting up the equipment they used, but their lack of experience and proper gear in a place like Eagle's Nest proved fatal. They were doomed from the beginning, he said. Darren and Dylan's gauges indicated that they had dropped to 230 feet. They were undoubtedly unprepared to handle such a dive. They didn't have the proper gas mixture in their tanks to breathe at such depths. They also lacked the necessary training and equipment as previously stated. Their deaths were investigated and it was assumed that the pair had followed the guideline to the ballroom's bottom. Then they descended into one of the two caves, reaching a depth of 230 feet. It was thought that they developed a condition known as nitrogen narcosis. This happens when divers descend below 100 feet. Without getting too technical, nitrogen narcosis is a drowsy feeling experienced by divers caused by high-pressure air. 
It can make divers feel drunk and impaired judgment, which is extremely dangerous when diving in deep water. Darren and Dylan could have easily lost track of time and how much air they were using if they were in that state. It was assumed that they had run out of oxygen by the time they returned to the ballroom. Investigators believed the son was the first to run out of air. Dylan had to have shown his father his air gauge, which was low. Darren most likely took out his regulator and placed it in his son's mouth as they attempted to leave Eagle's Nest. On the other hand, Darren's tank would have run out of air very quickly after this. Darren, it is assumed, passed out from a lack of oxygen and sank to the cave's floor. Dylan must have taken one last deep breath of air before attempting to swim to the surface. He used his water wings to propel himself forward. They must have lost the guideline in their panic, and Dylan could not find the exit. Darren Spivey and Dylan Sanchez died tragically. They were not the first or last divers to die in this notorious underwater cave system. If you decide to visit this magnificent and terrifying cave, make sure to come prepared and stay safe. On Saturday morning, October 15, 2016, three divers went to the Eagle's Nest sinkhole to experience life in its underwater cave system. Two of these three divers, Patrick Peacock and Chris Rittenmeyer, came from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. They were both experienced cave divers who had dived in different cave systems in Florida, Mexico, and South America. This wasn't their first adventure to Eagle's Nest. They had dived into the cave system in the past. Patrick was a diving instructor. The third diver, Justin Blakely, had no experience diving and had no idea what the cave system looked like. He arrived at the Eagle's Nest earlier than his two friends, so he waited for them. Patrick, Chris, and Justin arrived safely at the Eagle's Nest sinkhole, and they started their dive around 2 p.m. on Saturday, October 15, 2016. They all had their scuba gear with them, and they went straight to the entrance of the cave, which was covered with murky and unappealing water. Patrick and Chris, being experienced divers, went into the dark cave system, exploring some of the rooms within the cave. Justin, who wasn't that experienced, decided to stay close to the surface. The three divers planned to reassemble at a particular place by 3 p.m., which was just an hour and a half after they started their dive. Justin, who was diving alone, returned after about half an hour to the agreed location. When he got there, he couldn't find the other two divers, so he returned to diving again. He spent about 30 minutes again and returned to the same location, yet the two weren't there. He continued waiting, all to no avail. Justin began to panic when he couldn't see his friends returning from their dives after some hours. He wasn't experienced, so searching for them isn't an option for him. He had to return to the surface to call for help. At about 6 p.m., Justin was able to get through to the police, and many people came to the scene when the report was sent abroad. Search teams were set to start their operations. The first search team, John Bernot and Charlie Roberson, commenced their dive at around 11 p.m. They were searching the upstream passages. The dive plan was reported by the third diver, Justin, to be along that upstream. When the first search team entered, they started observing the decompression habitat and discovered three bottles marked O2 at 20 feet. At about 70 feet, four bottles were staged. Also, they saw two bottles that were marked 120, staged downstream from the guideline at about 120 feet into the cave but they went upstream according to the missing diver's dive plan. They did a comprehensive search throughout all the tunnels on the upstream side, but couldn't find the two divers. Then they returned to the entrance room, and from there, they searched through the tunnels downstream, together with the Lockwood Tunnel. There were no traces of the missing divers there. After a futile effort, the first search team returned to the surface at about 3.30 a.m. the following morning. The second search team, Ted McCoy and A.J. Gonzalez, started their dive around 3.45 a.m. They started with the downstream tunnels. Not long after their search began, they found the two bodies at an exit side of the pit, one of the largest rooms of the cave system. The second search team documented the details of the scene where the bodies were found, spending about 45 minutes doing that. From their observations, they discovered that one of the divers was still wearing his closed-circuit rebreather, but his bailouts were already displaced. Bailouts are underwater bottles used as an emergency gas supply in case the primary gas supply fails. They saw an empty gas cylinder beside him attached to his rig, and a long hose was also attached to it and was set up. 
His loop was out of his mouth and left open, and the hose that was on the inhale side was squeezed. Onboard O2 had 300 PSI left, but the onboard diluent bottle was empty. He did not have a primary light head, and the backup lights were not well positioned. The scooter they found wasn't close to him, but it was unclipped and turned off. The second missing diver, whose body was found in almost the same place, had a dry suit on him, along with his mask and fins. He had a backup light turned off and dangling from his pocket. He was positively buoyant. He had no other bottles close to him. There was a full gas cylinder stage on the exit side of the pit confinement, though it was difficult to know if something was there. They saw that the missing primary lighthead was found in the same place. They found another full cylinder downstream of the jump to the Lockwood Tunnel. Two of the four side-mounted bailouts were found downstream of the pit constraint but were empty. The second search team returned to the surface since their tasks were just to locate and document the details of the place the bodies were found. The following afternoon, which was Sunday, October 16, 2016, a team of two divers, Eric Deister and Colt Smith, went into the cave system with the details they'd gotten from the second search team to recover the bodies. They brought the two bodies out from around the pit exit side to the top of the ballroom. There were two other divers, Ken Salad and another diver, who were both waiting for the first recovery team. When they brought the bodies to them, they brought them to the surface. Another team then went to the scene on Monday, October 17, 2016, in the morning, to recover every other piece of equipment that was left in the cave system. John Bernot, the diver from the first search team, and James Draker were the team members that went for this equipment recovery. They found two scooters, the second missing diver's rebreather, and a bailout bottle at the gold line outside the constraint that was leading to revelation space. His closed circuit rebreather loop was closed, but seemed to be fully operational. They removed all these and handed them over to the authorities for evidence and proper analysis. Patrick and Chris's deaths became a topic for debate for several years among divers. No documented analysis of the cause of Patrick and Chris's deaths is available for the public. However, Chuck Walls, a diving expert, speculated that the unfortunate incident was the result of nitrogen narcosis. Patrick and Chris were both found in the most dangerous and complex area of the cave, at a depth of 260 feet, suggesting that nitrogen narcosis could have been the cause of their deaths. Nitrogen narcosis tends to occur when divers reach depths of about 100 feet. It results in loss of consciousness caused by a tranquilizing effect of some gases at high pressure. Anyone suffering from narcosis is not able to make the right judgment about his environment and will become confused. This oftentimes causes the divers to drown if they are not immediately able to surface or are not rescued. They considered Eagle's Nest to be a disastrous cave system that must be prohibited for further diving adventures since several divers have been lost in this dangerous cave. The entrance to the cave had earlier been banned by the state in 1999, but was opened again in 2003. This was a result of pressure mounted upon the state authorities by the National Association for Cave Divers and the National Speleological Society Cave Diving Section. At this same Eagle's Nest cave system, two divers lost their lives in 2013 on a Christmas day. The father and son went to test their Christmas gifts and new air tanks. Darren Spivey, a certified diver, and his son, who was just 15 years old with not much experience, went into the cave to test their air tanks. To find out what happened, check out the video on our channel. The depths of Troy Spring were a diver's paradise, a mesmerizing realm of crystal clear waters and breathtaking visibility. Divers from all over flocked to this secluded spot in Lafayette County, eager to explore the uncharted territories hidden beneath the surface. But on one fateful April day in 1990, the tranquility of Troy Spring was shattered by a tragic event that would change the course of history. The closing of Troy Spring was a devastating blow, not only to open water divers, but also to the cave and cavern diving community in north central Florida. Despite not being a traditional cave diving site, Troy Spring was widely regarded as one of the premier open water training locations in the southeastern United States, rivaled only by the legendary Crystal River. With its clear spring water, diverse range of depths, and long wide run to the Swanee River, Troy Spring was a diver's dream come true. 
It was also larger than many of the training pools used by visiting students, making it the perfect place to hone their skills. Aside from a popular open water training site, Troy Spring was also a unique and highly sought after location for instructors due to its exceptional features. With the exception of a small cave at the bottom and a few shallow overhanging ledges, there were no cavern areas that divers were likely to stray into, making it a safe and secure spot for training. But perhaps the most dangerous aspect of Troy Spring was the lack of regulations and oversight leaving divers to navigate the site without proper guidance and precautions. On April 14, 1990, John and Michael set out for a diving adventure at Troy Spring. As daring divers, they were no strangers to the thrill of exploring the depths of the water. However, what they didn't have was formal cave or cavern training. Before their dive, the pair visited a local hardware store where they purchased a spool of monofilament fishing line which they planned to use as a guideline during their dive. They also gathered their diving equipment and did a thorough check to make sure everything was in working order. They were excited to explore the unknown depths of the spring and set off with a sense of adventure and thrill. Despite the lack of training, the duo announced their intention to delve a little way into the extremely tiny cave at the 80-foot level. As they geared up and descended into the crystal clear waters of the spring, little did they know that this would be their last dive. They had spent the previous night discussing their plan to explore the tiny cave located at the 80-foot level. As they prepared to enter the water, several other divers gathered around, trying to convince them to stay in the open water. They warned John and Michael of the dangers of venturing into the cave without proper training citing the potential for disorientation, equipment failure, and strong currents. Despite the pleas of other divers to turn back and return to the safety of open water, John and Michael were determined to continue. They had spent weeks planning for this dive, and they were not going to let a little warning stop them. They were convinced they were experienced enough to handle the cave. They stepped confidently into the crystal clear spring water, not realizing that this would be the last time they would see the light of day. As they descended deeper and deeper into the cave, the other divers watched in horror, knowing that they had done everything in their power to prevent this tragedy. As they ventured deeper into the cave, the currents began to pick up, becoming stronger and more unpredictable. John, the lead diver, started to feel the effects of the current as his regulator began to free flow. With every breath, he felt a sense of panic rising within him as the air in his tanks started to dwindle at an alarming rate. The effort required to enter the cave had caused him to breathe harder and faster, exacerbating the problem. Michael, the second diver, was also struggling. He had managed to avoid the worst of the current, but his air consumption rate was extremely high. He had not been prepared for the level of exertion required to enter the cave, and his tanks were quickly running low. Unlike John, Michael did not have an octopus with which to share his air, and he knew that his fate was now inextricably linked to his partners. As they pushed deeper into the cave, the sense of danger and urgency grew with each passing moment. They knew they had to turn back, but the cave was so small that it would be a difficult and dangerous task. With their air supplies dwindling and the current becoming stronger and more unpredictable, the two divers were in a race against time to make it back to safety. The reality of their situation began to hit them like a freight train. The monofilament fishing line they had brought as a guideline, which they had thought would be their lifeline, proved to be no match for the powerful currents that swirled around them. They were quickly pulled away from the entrance, the only light and safety they had known just moments ago, now a distant memory. Their attempts to swim back to the surface were futile, as the lack of air and the disorientation caused by the cave's twists and turns made it impossible for them to find their way back. Fifty-five feet into the cave, the lead diver, John, ran low on air and attempted to share air with his already panicky buddy, Michael. Unfortunately, because Michael lacked an octopus, they could only attempt to pass a single second stage back and forth. 
The extremely heavy current that was present in the cave proved to be too much for the divers to handle. It forced them back towards the entrance, and in the process, both divers became hopelessly entangled in their do-it-yourself guideline. Panic set in as they realized they were truly lost, with no way of getting out of the cave alive. They struggled to keep their cool, but the fear of never seeing the light of day again was overwhelming. The last thing they saw were the walls of the cave closing in on them as the darkness consumed them completely. Trapped and unable to move, they drowned within sight of the surface. As the recovery specialists carefully made their way to the site of the tragic accident, the weight of the situation weighed heavily on their minds. They knew that every second counted and that every decision they made could mean the difference between life and death. As they reached the depths of the cave, the reality of the situation became clear. The lead diver, his body limp and lifeless, had run out of air and was unable to be saved. The second diver, though still alive, was in a critical state, his body tangled in the makeshift guideline they had brought with them. The specialists worked quickly, cutting through the tangled lines with precision and care, but even with their expertise, it took a grueling 10 minutes to free the second diver. Tragically, his buddy had also met the same fate. Unable to reach his second stage rebreather, despite having 1,700 pounds of air left. As the sun set on that fateful April 14, 1990, the news of the tragic drownings at Troy Springs spread like wildfire among the tight-knit diving community. The families of the two divers, John and Michael, were left to grapple with the devastating loss of their loved ones. The investigation into the incident revealed that both divers had suffered from a lack of air, with John's regulator free-flowing and Michael unable to reach his second-stage rebreather. The heavy current and disorientation had ultimately proved to be too much for the ill-prepared divers. The tragic drowning of two Palatka, Florida divers in Troy Spring was a shock to the diving community and raised concerns about the consequences of the lack of regulations and oversight at the site. The fact that access to Troy Spring required neither an admission fee nor adherence to a significant number of state, county, or private park rules may have contributed to the accident, as divers may not have been as aware of the potential risks and hazards of the site. Two days later, the executor of the estate that controls the right-of-way to the spring made the difficult decision to close the site to the public in order to prevent any future tragedies from occurring. With the looming threat of lawsuits and government intervention, the property could no longer afford the risk. The access road was blocked off, and with plans to convert the property into a boys' camp, it seemed unlikely that the spring would ever be open to divers again. The tragic story of John and Michael serves as a sobering reminder of the dangers of cave diving. Their decision to ignore the warnings of experienced divers and to venture into the cave without proper training ultimately cost them their lives. Despite the beauty and allure of the crystal clear spring water, it was a deadly trap that they could not escape. The death of these two young men was a profound loss for their families and friends and their memory will forever be etched in the hearts of those who knew them. But in the wake of their deaths, we must also remember the lessons that they have taught us. We must respect the power of nature and always be aware of the risks that we take. We must also remember that no adventure is worth sacrificing our lives for. Let us honor John and Michael by being vigilant and responsible in our own pursuits so that their deaths will not be in vain. This was the sixth cave diving marathon on this channel and the second Florida episode. Let us know what you think in the comments section. If you enjoyed watching, take a dive on the like and subscribe buttons and hit the bell icon so you get notified when we come back with another exciting cave diving story.